Welcome everyone uh, to the Portable MRI Journal Queen's uh, Radiology uh, Portable MRI webinar series. Uh, apologize for the slight delay, uh, but we're all set to go. Uh, my name is Omar Islam. I'm a neuroradiologist at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, and I'm very excited about this webinar. We have a very special talk by a world-renowned expert in the field of MRI safety. Uh, before we uh, get to him, I want to introduce uh, my colleagues on the panel here. Uh, first of all, we have Dr. Aditya Bharata from University of Toronto. Uh, Dr. Bharata is a division head of uh, diagnostic neuroradiology at St. Michael's Hospital, Unity Health, uh, where he is an associate professor of medical imaging. Uh, as it pertains to this webinar, Dr. Bharata is the co-editor-in-chief of the Portal MRI Journal. Uh, he is also a preeminent uh, expert in the clinical use of uh, portable MRI. His institution uh, at St. Mike's was the first academic center in Canada to install and use portable MRI in their ICU since um, 2022. So thank you, Aditya, for joining us and being uh, my co-host. Uh, we also have Dr. Edmund Knopp, uh, Eddie. Uh, it has nearly three decades of clinical care and research experience in radiology, neuroradiology, and MRI imaging. Uh, he's widely recognized as a pioneer in the field for his numerous accomplishments and thought leadership. In 2015, he was awarded the American Board of Radiology Lifetime Service Award. Uh, he joins us today in his role as a senior medical director for Hyperfine, which produces the ultra-low field MRI, the Hyperfine Scoop, picture of which is uh, behind and to the right of his shoulder. Uh, always a pleasure. <laughs> Always a pleasure, Eddie. Uh, thank, thank you for joining us. I'm going to uh, start by introducing Dr. Frank Shalok. So uh, just a little technical note. Uh, Frank was is not able to kind of log in visually, but he is here on the phone with us. So, uh, you know, he will be here for the Q&A uh, as well and for our roundtable discussion immediately after his talk when we will play his talk, which is about 30 minutes, after which uh, the Q&A will be wide open for everyone. And and uh, point out that uh, you know MR safety questions, whether they be for low field, ultra low field, or regular field MRI, are all fair game. Uh, Dr. Shalak has kindly agreed to uh, uh, give his expert opinion and advice on all sorts of MRI safety questions that you may have. So, uh, Dr. Frank Shalak is the director of MRI safety at USC Stephen Neuroimaging and Informatics Institute. Uh, he's an adjunct clinical professor of radiology and medicine at the Keck School of Medicine at USC. Um, and as a commitment to MRI safety, he has created and maintains the internationally popular website, uh, mrisafety.com, which we're all familiar with. He has authored or co-authored more than 280 publications in the peer-reviewed literature and has written over 90 book chapters. Um, and his most recent uh, work uh, is uh, MRI Biofacts Safety and Patient Management, uh, which includes contributions for, from over 50 internationally respected uh, author colleagues. He is the deputy editor for the Journal of Magnetic Resonance Imaging. He has lectured both nationally and internationally and has provided lectures on numerous, uh, two numerous organizations, including RSNA, Society for MR in Medicine, and the American College of Radiology and countless others. So his company, uh, Shellock R&D Services, specializes in the assessment of MRI-related issues for implants and devices and the evaluation of electromagnetic field related bioeffects. Um, in a nutshell, uh, he is the guru of MRI safety and we are uh, extremely honored uh, to have uh, his talk here today and for the opportunity to have a live discussion with Dr. Shalak. So without further ado, we're going to uh, start rolling his uh, talk now. Thank you, Pam. Welcome to the presentation entitled Managing Patients with Passive Implants on Low-Field MR Systems. For the purpose of my lecture, I'm defining low-field as any MR system that operates at a static magnetic low 1.5 Tesla. My name is Frank Shalak. I'm an adjunct clinical professor of radiology and medicine and the director of MRI safety at the Keck School of Medicine, University of Southern California in Los Angeles. I've been involved in the field of magnetic resonance imaging for more than 35 years. Besides conducting clinical and laboratory research, one of my areas of interest is to educate healthcare professionals concerning the important topic of MRI safety. 
A crucial aspect of MRI safety involves the proper management of patients with medical implants referred for magnetic resonance imaging exams. Therefore, this presentation was specially developed to help you understand essential information pertaining to the safe use of MRI technology when it comes to scanning patients with passive implants on low field scanners. Passive implants are items such as heart valve prostheses, orthopedic implants, and vascular stents that are medical devices that do not rely on their functions from electrical energy or other power source. As everyone knows, MRI safety is of utmost concern when imaging patients with implants and devices. Unfortunately, relatively few medical products are specifically labeled for low field strength MR systems, which poses problems for patients referred for MRI exams on these scanners. MRI facilities tend to have a policy to only scan patients with implants that have labeling information that pertains to their particular scanners. As such, a patient with an implant may be needlessly turned away because the radiologist or the supervising physician may not have a thorough understanding or appreciation about the MRI-related issues that impact medical implants. To avoid such an undesirable scenario, my presentation will review the specific low field related MRI issues for passive implants and discuss how to safely manage patients that have unlabeled devices. My lecture is organized as follows. First, I will discuss the various types of low field MR systems that exist throughout the world, including those with horizontal and vertical static magnetic fields and the ones with the unique features such as the dedicated extremity scanners the very low field portable MRI system, and the one designed for neonatal patients. Next, I'll present the various MRI related issues that impact passive implants and explain the testing and labeling of these medical products. Finally, I will provide guidelines for managing patients with passive implants referred for MRI exams on low field scanners, and I'll present general guidelines that can be used to facilitate and streamline the MRI screening process. Since 1986, I've tested thousands of passive as well as active implants using MR systems operating at field strengths ranging from 0.2 up to and including a Tesla. Therefore, I have a unique perspective when it comes to performing MRI exams in patients with all types of implants and devices. I hope that by the end of my presentation, you will gain the knowledge and confidence to manage patients with passive implants that were not tested and labeled for low field scanners, that is, those MR systems operating below 1.5 Tesla. Numerous manufacturers make low field MR systems and these encompass a wide range of scanner types and static magnetic field strengths that range from 0.58 up to 1.2 Tesla. Several unique scanners exist including the single-sided MR system from Promaxo that is used for prostate biopsies, the 0.064 Tesla portable MR system from Hyperfine, the various dedicated extremity scanners from SAOTE, the 0.6 upright MR system from Phonar, and the one Tesla Embrace neonatal MR system from Aspect Imaging. Now let's take a look at several representative examples of MR systems operating below 1.5 Tesla. Hyperfine's point of care portable swoop MR imaging system operating at the very low field strength of 0.064 Tesla is a unique scanner that allows neuroimaging of patients in virtually any clinical setting, including the emergency department and the intensive care unit. This vertical field scanner has a maximum spatial gradient magnetic field of 700 Gauss per centimeter. When it is used for imaging and never exceeds a head specific absorption rate or SAR value of 0.009 watts per kilogram. The swoop system has a unique feature called the Gauss guard, which expands to demarcate the five Gauss line when it is stationary or moving into a patient's room to perform an MRI exam of the brain. Because of its innovative design, 
There are no major issues related to ferromagnetic objects becoming missiles or projectiles as shown by this box cutter and fire extinguisher, both of which are made of ferromagnetic materials. Watch what happens when these items are brought up close to the Swoop MR system. For the box cutter, there is barely any attraction to the 0.064 static magnetic field, while the fire extinguisher exhibits virtually no magnetic field related issues. The ProMaxo scanner has a unique single-sided configuration that is specially designed to permit urologists to perform MRI-guided prostate interventional procedures in an in-office setting. This is a portable MR system that is easily rolled into place so that it can be set up for patient use within a matter of minutes. The ProMaxo scanner operates at a static magnetic field of 0.065 Tesla and it has a highest spatial gradient magnetic field of 60 Gauss per centimeter. SAOTE has several low field scanners that include the 0.25 Tesla vertical field S-Scan MR system and the 0.25 G-Scan Brio. The G-Scan has a rotating gantry that permits MRI exams to be performed on the patient's musculoskeletal system during weight bearing. SAOTE also makes the dedicated extremity O-scan system operating with a vertical magnetic field of 0.31 Tesla and finally the 0.4 Tesla Magnifico scanner which also has a vertical magnetic field. This is the Freemax MR system from Siemens. It uses a horizontal field magnet that operates at 0.55 Tesla and it has a highest spatial gradient magnetic field of 230 Gauss per centimeter. The Freemax scanner is the first MR system with an 80 centimeter wide bore, which permits it to accommodate physically large patients. Phonar's 0.6 Tesla upright multi-position MRI is an MR system that can scan patients in any position, including sitting, standing, during flexion and extension, or lying down. This scanner has a horizontal field that is transverse to the patient and has a maximum spatial gradient magnetic field value of 408 Gauss per centimeter. The 1.0 Tesla Embrace Neonatal MRI scanner from Aspect Imaging was designed specifically for use inside the neonatal intensive care unit. This permits infants to undergo MRI of the brain at any time, allowing for a quicker diagnosis and treatment while reducing the problems typically associated with transporting critically ill neonates to a conventional MRI facility. The Embrace MR system is self-shielded and does not require special sighting considerations. Because of its unique design, there are no issues related to ferromagnetic objects or the need for MR conditional patient support equipment. By way of example, take a look at the Embrace scanner installation in a typical neonatal ICU. Note the presence of a standard incubator, conventional physiological monitoring equipment, a ventilator, an infusion pump, and steel oxygen tanks all positioned in close proximity to the neonatal MR system. Finally, there are MR systems that operate just under 1.5 Tesla, namely the OASIS and the OASIS Velocity vertical field 1.2 Tesla scanners from Fujifilm Healthcare. These systems have a maximum spatial gradient magnetic field of 2,420 Gauss per centimeter, which is higher than the maximum spatial gradient magnetic field values that are associated with 1.5 Tesla horizontal field scanners. The possible implications of this 2,420 Gauss per centimeter spatial gradient magnetic field with respect to the force acting on a passive implant is discussed later in my presentation. The establishment of thorough and effective screening procedures for patients is one of the most critical components of a program that guards the safety of those preparing to undergo MRI exams. Healthcare professionals who are specially trained in all aspects of MRI safety are responsible for screening patients. Proper screening involves the use of a written form and a verbal interview that is conducted by a safety trained healthcare professional in order to identify health conditions and items 
such as passive implants that may pose safety issues for the patient. These healthcare professionals should understand the potential hazards associated with the information contained on the screening forms and have inclusive knowledge of relevant safety information. A critical aspect of protecting patients from MRI-related accidents involves a complete understanding of the factors that may pose hazards for medical implants. In many instances at MRI centers that have low field strength scanners, the MRI technologist or radiographer encounters a passive implant of the patient that was not labeled for an MR system operating below 1.5 Tesla. How exactly may this patient be afforded the known advantages of scanning on a low field MR system and how can they be safely managed and not simply turned away, which unfortunately often happens. Now let's take a close look at the MRI-related issues that impact passive implants with respect to scanners operating with horizontal or vertical field magnets. Similar to the issues that are present when imaging patients with implants using conventional horizontal field 1.5 or 3 Tesla scanners, there are specific factors that need to be considered when imaging patients with passive implants using MR systems operating at lower field strengths. First, the magnetic field interactions, namely force and torque, are dependent on the strength of the static magnetic field. For vertical field scanners, consideration should be given to the fact that the static magnetic field is in a vertical direction. With respect to the force acting on an implant, the maximum patient accessible spatial gradient magnetic field also needs to be taken into account. With respect to MRI related heating, the transmit RF frequency impacts the amount of heating that occurs for a given implant, which is predominantly dependent on the implant's length. Notably, heating has been reported to be greater at a lower frequency than at a higher frequency, depending on the length of certain implants. For vertical field scanners, further consideration should be given to the direction of the E-fields, which is perpendicular. Importantly, peer-reviewed publications have reported that perpendicularly oriented E-fields associated with vertical field MR systems operating at 1.2 Tesla and 49.5 MHz result in less heating for certain passive implants as well as for active implants. The last remaining issue to be aware of for implants is that artifacts are inherently lower on scanners operating at field strengths lower than 1.5 Tesla. I previously mentioned that consideration should be given to the spatial gradient magnetic field information with respect to implants and devices, so I'd like to make a few important points about this variable. It should be noted that the spatial gradient magnetic field is the field that varies in intensity over distance. When an implant is assessed for force, the test apparatus with the implant is placed at the point of the highest patient accessible spatial gradient magnetic field. When such testing is performed, the implant is suspended by a string and therefore it is freely able to move in space. The resulting information is the value of the spatial gradient magnetic field that was used for the force test and that information becomes part of the MRI labeling for the implant. It should be noted that in virtually every case, once the medical product is implanted, there are counter forces that act on the implant which are associated with the surrounding tissue or by virtue of having some form of fixation, such as those associated with sutures, screws, or other form of fixation that provide retention of the implant that all contribute to a margin of safety with respect to the translational attraction or force related issues. In consideration of this information, it should be realized that not following a particular spatial gradient magnetic field value for an implant does not necessarily pose a serious risk to a patient relative to magnetic field related force because of the aforementioned counter forces that are present. So now you are aware of the factors that may impact passive implants in association with low field strength MR systems. Let's next examine the testing and labeling strategy for medical products along with what happens when a patient with an implant presents for an MRI exam. 
First, the implant manufacturer either engages a third-party test house, such as my group, to conduct an evaluation of their product, or they perform the testing in-house. The tests are based on documents from the American Society for Testing and Materials International and include assessments of force, torque, MRI-related heating, and artifacts. Next, the manufacturer submits the test results to the Food and Drug Administration or other regulatory body for review. If the information is deemed acceptable, MRI-related labeling is included in the Instructions for Use or the Product Information Manual for the implant. When a patient with an implant presents for an MRI exam, the MRI technologist or radiographer obtains the information for the implant and carefully follows the labeling, which involves making sure that the relevant conditions are met to ensure patient safety. Be aware that in the vast majority of cases, the MRI testing and labeling typically only applies to 1.5 and or 3 Tesla scanners because these are the primary MRI systems used for clinical imaging worldwide. And to my knowledge, with the exception of a few cochlear implants, there are no implants that have been specifically tested and labeled below a field strength of 1.5 Tesla. As such, there is a general lack of labeling information for low field strength MR systems. When asked how to manage patients with implants and devices, the manufacturers of scanners operating below 1.5 Tesla typically advise their users to follow the product's instructions for use, which is obviously not very helpful since, as I indicated, very few implants have ever been intentionally tested and labeled for low field strength MR systems. And it appears that based on my experience, Manufacturers of implants are not interested in pursuing testing and labeling for any MR systems operating below 1.5 Tesla. Therefore, what exactly can be done to safely manage patients with passive implants referred for exams on low field MR systems as opposed to simply not scanning them? In the situation when a patient presents for an MRI exam with an unlabeled passive implant, the standard of care is for the radiologist or supervising physician to make a decision to scan the patient based on a careful assessment of the risks versus benefits for the exam, taking into consideration those various factors that I previously discussed in my presentation that potentially pose a risk. This patient management strategy is supported by the Manual on MR Safety from the American College of Radiology. As indicated by the ACR, the final determination of whether or not to scan a patient is to be made by the level 2 MR physician responsible for the patient or the MRMD. A level 2 MR physician is essentially an individual that has been extensively trained and educated in the broader aspects of MRI safety issues, including but not limited to issues related to the potential for problems associated with performing MRI exams in patients with implants and devices. Taken into consideration the information that I presented, it is acceptable to develop a written policy to manage patients referred for MRI exams on low field strength scanners who have passive implants labeled at 1.5 and or 3 Tesla. And in fact, that is exactly what numerous MRI centers have done to facilitate patient screening. Considering the information that I presented, MRI centers can implement a written policy with general guidelines for scanners operating below 1.5 Tesla in order to safely manage patients with passive implants that have been labeled for 1.5 and or 3 Tesla systems. The written policy should give attention to the following information. First, the policy should be established by the supervising physician who is ultimately responsible for patient safety. This individual should have a complete understanding about the MRI-related issues that can impact a passive implant. Considering the effects of force, torque, and MRI-related heating, patients with virtually all passive implants that have been labeled at 1.5 and or 3 Tesla can be safely scanned on MR systems operating below 1.5 Tesla. This includes scanners with horizontal or vertical fields, or another way to consider the direction of the static magnetic field is with reference to the field being longitudinal 
or transfers to the patient undergoing MR imaging. To ensure patient safety from a MR field consideration, a margin of safety may be provided to the patient by operating the MR scanner in the normal operating mode, which defaults the whole body average specific absorption rate to a value of 2 watts per kilogram. Special consideration should be given to certain passive implants that have functional components such as programmable cerebral spinal fluid shunt valves, magnetically activated orthopedic implants, or other similar devices. For a programmable CSF shunt valve, you should follow the labeling conditions that indicate that a suitable healthcare professional should check the pressure setting of the valve before the MRI exam and then recheck and reset the CSF shunt valve as needed after the MRI procedure. Recently, I developed general guidelines for certain types of passive implants in an effort to facilitate and streamline the MRI screening procedure. By following these guidelines, it is not necessary for the MRI technologist or radiographer to search for and review the MRI-related labeling for these particular passive implants. Passive internal orthopedic implants are defined as medical devices that are entirely implanted in patients that have no electronic components or sources of power. These passive orthopedic implants include disc replacement implants, nails, pins, plates, rod screws, sternal enclosure devices, wires, and total or partial joint replacement implants used for the hips, knees, shoulders, elbows, or other joints. Most orthopedic implants are made of weakly or non-ferromagnetic materials including commercially pure titanium, titanium alloy, cobalt-based alloys, tantalum, magnesium-based alloys, and austenitic or non-magnetic stainless steel. For orthopedic implants made of ferromagnetic material, in situ counterforces will be present that will prevent movement or dislodgement of the device in association with exposure to the static magnetic field of an MR system. While there is a theoretical risk of MRI-related heating of certain passive internal orthopedic implants, such as internal fixation systems used for the spine, to date, there has been no evidence of substantial heating occurring in a patient nor a report of a patient burn associated with these implants related to the clinical use of MRI examinations. In consideration of this information, general guidelines were developed for patients with passive internal orthopedic implants as follows. MRI exams may be performed at three Tesla or less, and that includes scanning patients on MR systems with longitudinal or transverse-oriented static magnetic fields. There is no restriction for the value of the spatial gradient magnetic field. For passive internal orthopedic implants located inside of the area of the transmitted RF energy, use a whole body average specific absorption rate of 2 watts per kilogram with the MR system operating in the normal operating mode. For passive internal orthopedic implants located entirely outside of the area of the transmitted RF field, there is no restriction for the RF energy. The maximum imaging time is 15 minutes per pulse sequence and multiple pulse sequences are allowed. These general guidelines should only be implemented for use after the careful review of the supervising physician responsible for the MRI facility and with the adoption of the information as a written policy. Additionally, these guidelines must be reviewed on an annual basis to confirm that no passive internal orthopedic implant has become available that is labeled MR unsafe. Examples of orthopedic implants that are excluded from these general guidelines include external fixation systems, cervical fixation systems such as halo vests, magnetically controlled or programmable implants, bone fusion stimulation systems, prosthetic limbs, and prostheses with microprocessors. Let's next examine general guidelines for patients with heart valve prostheses and annuloplasty rings, both of which are passive implants that are commonly encountered in patients referred for MRI exams. With respect to the heart valve prostheses, I'm referring to all types, including the older versions that require implantation using a thoracotomy, as well as the newer ones that are implanted via a less invasive procedure which include transcatheter aortic valve replacements, 
transcatheter heart valves used for the mitral valve, as well as other similar prosthetic heart valves. Annuloplasty rings are passive implants that are used to tighten, reshape, or reinforce the ring or annulus around a valve in the heart. For patients with heart valve prostheses and rings used for the valves of the heart, these individuals can undergo MRI at three Tesla or less, regardless of the value of the spatial gradient magnetic field, using an MR system reported whole body average SAR of two watts per kilogram, maximum imaging time of 50 minutes per pulse sequence, and multiple sequences are allowed per patient. Additional general guidelines for certain implants are also posted on my website, mrisafety.com, and these also pertain to MR systems operating at three Tesla or less. The information is for coronary artery stents, regardless of the number of stents that are implanted in the patient, vascular access ports, and embolization coils used for cerebral aneurysms. For those of you that love to read peer-reviewed journals like I do, there will soon be an article published in the Journal of Magnetic Resonance Imaging entitled, Managing Patients with Unlabeled Passive Implants on MR Systems Operating Below 1.5 Tesla, that will provide additional details pertaining to the topic that I just presented. So now you know about the MRI-related issues associated with scanners operating below 1.5 Tesla that impact passive implants. For those of you who are physicians that are responsible for your low field MR systems, I trust that you have an appreciation of the vital information that will allow you to establish a general policy to safely manage patients with passive implants. If you need additional information on MRI bioeffects, safety and patient management, I invite you to visit my website, mrisafety.com. If you need an immediate response, please send me an email at frank.shellock at mrisafety.com. And this brings us to the end of my presentation. I'd like to thank each and every one of you for your time and attention. Uh, thanks, Dr. Shellock. That was uh, an outstanding presentation and just an excellent overview of MRI safety issues. Um, I really appreciated that, uh, that review. Um, and we're really glad to have you uh, successfully join us uh, on the on the webcast as well. Welcome. Thank you. Great to be here. So I've typed a note to the uh, participants to enter their questions in the chat. Uh, but to get things started, I thought I would uh, put you on the spot with a couple of tough questions that I've got for you. So we're very interested in the use of the uh, very low field portable MRI system, the 0.064 uh, Tesla uh, system that... Uh, uh, of the portable MRI, the uh, hyperfine unit. And the questions really come up um, with respect to the fact that it's a head scanning unit and a lot of the patients in the ICU have shunts, some of which are programmable. Right. Um, is it possible to predict whether or not uh, this system can be safely used without reprogramming of the shunts uh, or checking of the shunts? I think this is really kind of an interesting and uh, unknown question right now. Can that be predicted from the anticipated deflection forces, or does it require sort of testing in, in, uh, in patients, do you think? Yes, it's not a matter of the force and torque acting on it, but it uh, gets down to what type of magnetic programmed. Um, those component. are the electronic. I thought some of them were like a dial-based system and some are electronic, or maybe I'm mistaken. Well, then. But the ones, yeah, I'm, both, the yeah. ones I'm familiar with the most and the ones that I've tested over the years are they incorporate little magnets and they have an external programmer Right. in order to adjust the pressure up or down. Right. And as it stands, you know, we do know that even certain types, like even a refrigerator magnet could potentially um, cause a, uh, a, um, an adjustment or an inadvertent change in the pressure setting. So as a rule right now, I think it's uh, important to follow what currently exists for the MR conditional labeling, meaning that you need to check the level um, of the setting mm -hmm. prior to the MRI. And that means uh, an, a um, healthcare professional that's capable of doing that and understands what he or she is doing and has the proper programmer uh, and, or you could you know, identify it using a plain film x-ray. Right. And then after the MRI exam, reset it or check it and reset it as needed until we actually uh, start testing 
of the various types of programmable CSF shunt valves that exist. And there are many versions of them too. Yes. There are some that are uh, being designed that are, are a little more robust with regard to the potential of an external magnetic field to uh, inadvertently change the setting. And um, those are undergoing uh, testing right now at 1.5 and 3T. We, we also know that at seven Tesla, all bets are off. Those things tend to need to be uh, adjusted um, immediately right after uh, the MRI exam because those tend to uh, uh, have a pressure changing setting uh, when they're being exposed to that very high field system. Right, and the same question comes in with pacemakers with respect to potential alteration of the programming or modes uh, due to, uh, I guess, magnetic as well as uh, um, um, gradients and so on. Um, the question that's been asked is whether or not um, with the location of the pacemaker device with respect to the magnet um, in the very low field systems, whether or not in, there can be any inference of safety or not. Uh, and again, whether that or whether that needs to be tested or done on a device specific level, because again, from the from this in the setting of the ICU environment, it would be very elegant to be able to say, maybe we can scan these patients without having to get the electrophysiology team back, uh, you know, to make the uh, to recheck the system. But right now we're following standard conventional MRI safety protocols. I know that, you know, this is sort of speculation, but do you have any sense of where that may end up going? Yes. I mean, we did uh, testing of uh, cardiac pacemakers and ICDs with one of the niche um, extremity systems many, many years ago. And so there's a body of evidence. And, you know, we know based on the fields that are being used for these uh, scanners operating below 1.5 Tesla, that you have a margin of safety. We also know that there's a huge number of uh, individuals with standard cardiac pacemakers that have safely undergone MRI procedures by following a specific protocol. The specific design of the swoop system and where the fields are located and the fact that uh, there are no concerns with regard to MRI-related heating of the uh, leads and electrodes, obviously the pulse generator is not going to be exposed to RF. The time-varying gradient magnetic fields are not going to induce currents. So all the things that we're typically concerned about with regard to active cardiac implants uh, basically don't exist when you're scanning with the uh, Swoop MR system. But, you know, as I mentioned, for the uh, programmable CSF shunt valves, we need to take a prudent approach until the studies are done uh, with regard to the particular make, model, and manufacture of the active uh, cardiac uh, pacemakers, as well as neuromodulation systems, um, it's, uh, which are many of those exist as well. And virtually all of them are located below the neck of the patient, with the exception of deep brain stimulation systems and uh, vagus nerve stimulation systems, and maybe a couple of others. No, I'm by no means any kind of expert on how the pacemaker systems themselves work. But my understanding at conventional MRI and in our protocols, we have the electrophysiologist recheck uh, both. The, first of all, they put it into the MR mode if possible, right. but even for non- uh, non-conditional pacemakers, we'll have them do a check of the pacemaker function at the end of the MRI examination. We're starting to do some off-label uh, uh, non-conditional uh, pacemakers. So I guess the question is, do you think that type of checking is required if we scan a patient uh, with the swoop unit in the ICU? Does, does the pacemaker actually need to be checked at the end of that exam to make sure it's in functioning correctly in the correct mode? Yeah, I would do it at this point until we get data. And, okay. you know, that doesn't require the electrophysiologist. They're, they got a lot more things. to be. Yeah, no, we, we have a technology uh, EP yeah. tech team that come, but even, even, yeah. even negotiating that is actually uh, is not yeah. trivial. So it would be I know. Really helpful in the workflow if, if we got the kind of evidence base to, to not have to do that. But I, I realize we, we aren't there yet, potentially. That's correct. What type of, what type of, uh, I guess, uh, would how would how would that actually be developed? Would that be with scanning of devices, or do we also require scanning patients to prove that there's no uh, effect? Like, is there is there work underway to do that? Yeah, I mean, all of this work can be done using uh, ex vivo techniques, and that's what's been done. We use worst case conditions mm -hmm. uh, when we're performing, you know, those types of evaluations. You definitely have to have the buy-in by the MR uh, or the manufacturers of the cardiac devices because ultimately 
you want, you know, to have their engineering staff, their product managers, you know, uh, involved because at the end of the day, what would be great is if you get labeling specific to that particular cardiac device and, and the uh, swoop system, which, you know, this, that's going to happen down the road, I believe. I see. We would like to add something from our standpoint and that we do have an investigative site that's going to start undertaking specifically that. They're going to be scanning their pa or their patients that are being scanned at high field will be immediately followed up with the swoop scanner and the devices will be interrogated between the exams and that, you know, they're going to publish that information. So hopefully we'll get some insight in an in vivo uh, situation. And Eddie, will that be for what types of uh, implants are going to be studied in that protocol? It's, it's going to be basically all comers coming okay. to, you know, they have pacemaker day on their systems and okay. it's basically cardiac defibrillators or a variety of the pacemakers. And are they also going to look at shunts potentially, programmable shunts? This particular project is just looking at pacemakers. Okay. I will say though, there has been, and it's coming to fruition, a pediatric hydrocephalus protocol mm -hmm. study that we've undertaken from three different sites with I think 150 patients where they also incorporated into that data on the, the need to reprogram or not reprogram uh, the shunts. And that'll be coming to publication, I would imagine the next year. Okay. So, uh, Aditya, there's a couple of questions uh, in the Q&A, but uh, perhaps while you're reading those, I can uh, ask uh, Dr. Shalak a question or two. Um, uh, good afternoon, Frank. Thanks for joining us. A wonderful talk. Um, so I have a question. I, I found your slide on the uh, where you talked about the manufacturers of implants not uh, being interested in testing below 1.5 T. I find that quite interesting. And and excuse my naivete, but uh, I, I was wondering, is that just because of financial reasons or or otherwise? Uh, what, why is it? Because I would think that uh, they would be most interested in having more widespread use of their implants and, and make it easier on all of us when well, we go and search for, for these devices, whether they're suitable for a low field MRI or not. Yeah, I mean, that would be great. But, you know, the reality is until you get a large enough market share you know, of MR systems that are operating, you know, below 1.5 Tesla, it's just not going to happen. Yeah. And I got to tell you, uh, I have, you know, hundreds of um, device manufacturing clients and I've, you know, every time I test something, I'm like, hey, would you like this tested at seven Tesla? And what about the lower field systems? And almost without exception, they're just not interested because it's so much time, energy and expense to get testing and labeling at 1.5 and 3 Tesla, they're just happy to get that information out the door and into their instructions for use. The 1.5 Tesla system is the workhorse. You know, it exists throughout the world. 3 Tesla is the highest field strength and high widespread use. And um, I don't see it happening in any, uh, you know, short-term basis. You know, I'll keep pushing from my end. And I've got thousands of implants, you know, that I've collected over the years that I could test these things and put it in the literature. But, you know, at the end of the day, a lot of the MR facilities, they want to see it in writing. They want to see it in the instructions for use or the product manual for the implanted device before they, and it's because I think of a relative lack of knowledge or appreciation about what the real potential issues are. And as you uh, heard from my presentation, very low risk, you know, of any situation when you have a passive implant that's been tested and labeled at 1.5 or 3 Tesla when you're scanning at one point but below 1.5 Tesla. So hopefully with this information, um, we'll have, um, you know, situations where patients will not be unnecessarily denied MRI exams, which I've seen happen in way too many instances. And as a follow-up, you mentioned that cochlear implants have been tested. Uh, yes. and, and are those uh, safe uh, at uh, low field strengths? So for the cochlear implants, uh, what was happening is uh, these were implants that obviously have a magnet uh, component that are virtually all cochlear implants have implanted magnets. And those magnets are used to hold the external part of the sound processor, the you know their components. Um, microphones, what have you, uh, in the proper orientation, you know, on the, uh, the back of the patient's head. 
And those um, you know, magnets can be demagnetized at higher levels. These are, I'm talking about the older cochlear implants. They only were tested at uh, 0.2 and 0.3 Tesla. So um, there are newer ones that are, um, have a, a newer magnet design where the magnets actually are able to rotate in their housing. So they basically will rotate uh, along the lines, the flux lines of the MR system. And so the tugging and pulling and the uncomfortable you know, situations that patients are subjected to where they're being scanned at 1.5 or 3 Tesla basically go away with those uh, newer models, those latest generation of cochlear implants. I'm convinced that those will be uh, uh, safe for patients undergoing MRI exams on the lower field systems and, and definitely at 0 0.064 Tesla. So we need to get the cochlear implant to manufacturers interested in getting those devices tested because they're used uh, on a widespread basis, particularly in uh, pediatric populations. Thanks. As a follow-up uh, before I pass it back on to Aditya, uh, so Eddie, I have a question for you about, uh, about the cochlear implants. Have have uh, patients been scanned with cochlear implants on hyperfine? And Not that I'm aware of, Omar. Not yet. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, I might mention also, um, you have two different scenarios. Either the magnet is allowed to be left in place or the magnet is removed. And that means the patient has to undergo two, you know, minor surgical procedures to remove the magnet. They put in a dummy magnet, do the MRI exam, and then they reverse the uh, process and replace the uh, a magnet back in its position, you know, patients don't want to go through that. So they have the uh, other design where the magnets allowed to be left in place, but now you have that massive artifact associated with, you know, highly magnetic material being present. And, you know, on a 1.5 or three Tesla scanner, it almost obliterates the whole area of interest if you're imaging the patient's brain, right? So, but at, at 0 0.064, you know, now the artifact is automatically dialed down. So there may be some inherent advantages for assessing the brain uh, and the ability to see the anatomy better, you know, on 0 0.064 when you're scanning a patient with a cochlear implant where the magnet's left in place. Exactly. I think that could be a great use case scenario for ultra low field is, is those patients with cochlear implants yeah. where, we, where we need to see the posterior fossa specifically sometimes. Thank you. Yeah, we've seen that anecdotally in um, patients who had metal cranioplasty uh, right. mesh, mesh flaps, especially the older ones from the 80s that I think some of them were ferromagnetic. Yeah. Uh, we scanned one patient like that and we, you know, we couldn't see anything with CT from all the streak artifact from the metal and we would expect a significant dropout. Yeah, on I mean, conventional MR, but we, we get almost no artifact on the uh, on the very low field on the hyperfine swoop. Yeah, definitely in the uh, 80s, they were using um, magnetic forms of stainless steel. And so the mm -hmm. artifacts, you know, were enormous as a result of that. So I've got a couple of questions in the chat, and I'm going to start with one that I think uh, will be a, sort of a quick one. Um, are there any data or just your own experience about patients who have cosmetic piercing, piercings like nose rings uh, that cannot be removed immediately? Uh, this came up with uh, at one of the sites, I guess this is actually the Kingston site that was scanning in Winnebago. Mm -hmm. um, what would you, your feeling be about cosmetic piercings? And I guess we talk about tattoos and things at the, ultra, at the very low field, like the hyperfine swoop. So obviously, you know, I've collected a lot of the, I, I live not too far from Venice Beach and it's like tattoo parlor, piercing place, ta you know, so that's like a lot of those, uh, uh, you know, retail places that exist not too far from where I live. And I've collected a lot of piercing jewelry over the years and tested it. And I'm telling you, those things are made out of all different types of materials and I'm uh, staying even the so-called surgical stainless steel, some of them are magnetic. And so, we need to handle those on a case-by-case -case basis. If you can't remove them or the patient's reluctant to remove them, then we secure it in place. These are relatively small items. And so MRI-related heating is not an issue. If it is a concern, then we uh, apply a, um, a cold compress or an ice bag to mitigate possible heating. And then if it's uh, potentially ferromagnetic, which you can easily determine, with a handheld magnet or ferromagnetic detection system, then we secure it in place with, which is easily done with adhesive tape. 
but you know you can expect an artifact where's the artifact it's going to be localized to where the piercing is and hopefully that's not the area of interest for the mri exam and then specifically for the hyperfine swoop at the 0.064 t our, our experience is that it has been feasible to scan these patients i, I would say we even sort of relaxed some of those uh, high field recommendations and when you consider where the where the piercing is in relation to the uh to the the scanner as well in in most cases it really has not uh, been an issue it's eyebrow lip here yeah, that's where you might start to exactly <laughs> Um, okay, the other, but certainly the ones that are more remote, we've we've completely ignored, I would say, but even the ones in the face, like we, we do the same. We do a reasonable attempt to remove it, but otherwise we just make sure it's secured and we haven't uh, had difficulties. And I would say that anecdotally, the artifact is very, very, very little from um, metallic piercings at the very low field strength of the hyperfine swoop. Um, there's a question now about uh, coming back to, you talked about the 1.2 Tesla vertical scanner with the higher spatial field gradient. Right. Are there any scenarios it's being asked where that high spatial field gradient would present an issue to passive MR conditional implants? <clears throat> Great uh, question. And, you know, I go back uh, in MRI with testing and labeling, you know, back to the really the onset, you know, 83, 84, 85. And there was a time when the labeling would only report the static magnetic field information. Okay. That's all fine and Danny. It's straightforward. But you know, when we started going from these long bore to these short bore, wide bore systems, the spatial gradient was dramatically different. And in fact, our group, as well as others, we reported that the flexion angles, you know, when we're measuring force, were obviously higher on the ones with had a shorter bore, higher spatial gradient magnetic fields. So now somebody at FDA got it in their mind, okay, we got to start reporting spatial gradient magnetic field information. I wish we would have never gone down that path because it drives everybody crazy. You know, think, where's the plot? Where, where's the uh, field in relation to where the implant is in the patient, et cetera, et cetera. That is a huge waste of time in my opinion. And I cannot think of any implant that if you did not follow the spatial gradient magnetic field value, that you would pose a hazard to the patient. And so the question being, do I know of any implant that if you went from a vertical bore to a horizontal bore, and especially considering how much higher the spatial gradient magnetic field values are on the uh, 1.2 Tesla scanner compared to 1.5 Tesla scanner, I don't see that any harm or additional risk or a hazard would be caused to the patient. And I go back to you know reminding individuals you know, when we're testing these things, we're, you know, dangling them from a string that's uh, attached to an inverted protractor, you know, it's freely able to move in space. That's not what happens with an implant. The implants are implanted or there's partially in or partially out of the patient. There's always counter forces present that come from many different sources, you know, including, you know, whatever's used to fix it in place sutures, you know, glues, um, uh, cement, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And then fibrosis of the uh, tissue and tissue yeah. ingrowth. All these um, uh, counter forces will prevent anything that's even ferromagnetic from being moved or dislodged in the patient. And be aware that there are even magnetic implants that are used, magnetically programmed uh, orthopedic implants, you know, the magnetically active CSF shunt valves, et cetera, et cetera. There's a whole slew of implants that have magnetic components, the batteries and a lot of the pulse generators, and don't, none of those have ever posed a harm to the patient. So, you know, <laughs> I wish we could get away from, you know, um, having to search for spatial gradient information and how do we deal with that? And, you know, it's one thing to follow the labeling, but it's another thing to have an understanding of the practical aspects of what may or may not, you know, really impact the patient from a safety consideration with respect to force or even torque acting on an implant. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. So I'm going to move tax entirely. There's another interesting question here, which uh, has been raised, which has to do with embolization coils, which are widely understood to be safe. Yeah. Um, but the question asked is that, um, has anyone performed MR safety testing of embolization coils in the uncoiled orientation? So most of the time they're balled up in an aneurysm, but in certain yeah. 
I think uh, embolizations of the venous system and the yeah. um, gonadal veins and things, they may be lengthwise like a yeah. wire-like configuration. Yeah. And would you expect any problems in that configuration? Yeah, great question. And, you know, when I talk about embolization coils, I look, you know, I show images of them used for a cerebral aneurysm, you know, something used in the head region versus, you know, outside that area. And yes, now you have something either shaped like a sphere versus an elongated shape. Something's long. Now we're starting to worry about MRI-related heating. Uh, and the other thing is um, I'm developed um, embolization coil related uh, general guidelines, but they only pertain to cerebral uh, aneurysm based uh, embolization coils, not anything that's located outside that application. And the reason is there is number one, a concern for the fact that there are ferromagnetic embolization coils that still exist. That's one concern. I don't think they're going to go anywhere. I don't, I think, you know, once they're deployed and, you know, for their intended use, they're going to be you know, not posing a hazard to the patient. But there is that concern about the length of the uh, embolization coil. But keep in mind that, um, yes, you could have heating, and we could probably demonstrate it very easily. In fact, we have with some of our um, ex vivo testing where we're using a uh, fluid-filled or a gel saline-filled phantom. We're instrumenting it with fiber optic thermometry probes. And depending on the length, you could have excessive heating. But where these things are deployed on the vascular system and you're having flow present, um, flow is a great way of mitigating. Right. And so, you know, again, what is this being used for? You know, we need to separate what we're seeing with ex vivo yeah. testing techniques that don't incorporate perfusion or flow or anything else there, you know, but because we're always doing worst case, it's a static system. So of course, we're going to see a lot of heating in many instances, but once it's used during its intended use, you know, it's a whole different scenario. Yeah. So on that note, I maybe just ask uh, uh, Omar and Eddie, uh, uh, at our institution, we, we basically scan patients with embolization coils without doing a deep dive on the composition of the coil or what configuration it is. And uh, we've also made that assumption that even if it is one of the old uh, ferromagnetic steel coils that basically the main effect would be heating, not movement, considering that it's implanted in the vascular system, probably in a thrombosed vessel or so on. And we kind of infer that um, even the heating effects, we might tell the, we would tell the patient to tell us if they have an, but we do go ahead and scan. Do any of you actually do a, uh, an investigation of a, of a coiling patient, um, Omar or Eddie, or anyone, uh, or Frank too, on the clinical yeah. side? What are you doing in practice? So in short, uh, we do exactly what you said. Uh, um, we go ahead and scan, and you know we ask the patient throughout the exam uh, how they're doing and whether there's any excessive heating that they feel anything. Yeah. Uh, so we don't. Can, I, back can back. I make one comment before you continue? Sure. Uh, both of you said we asked the patient. Terrible idea. Do not rely <laughs> on the patient. You know, you give the patient the squeeze ball. Let me know if you feel heating. I did, you know, experiments involving myself where I was testing uh, EKG electrodes and leads um, and, you know, quickly found out that during the pre-scan, I received burns where each of those things were located. So by the time you actually sense something happening, when a dramatic heating and excessive heating occurs, it's almost instantaneous and you're going to have a burn. The other thing is, where is that object located? Is this something where where there are thermal sensors it may not be mm -hmm. so they're not going to feed, feel anything so don't rely on a patient to tell you that they feel something like heating because it's just the wrong strategy um and i can't emphasize that enough i mean i go back again you know our you know we didn't know what we were doing half the time with implants and the radiologist said well let's start out slow and you know we'll ramp it up at the sar and let's see if the patient complains about it we didn't know enough, but I think now we know that, uh, and, and I have firsthand experience, plus I can show you temperature plots. When something's going to heat, that temperature can shoot up, you know, 10, 15, 20 degrees in a matter of a second or two. Well, that's, that's really uh, sobering for us because it's so built into uh, to the I know. protocols I know. To, uh, to do that. <laughs> I was guilty of it too. But Frank, that heating is going to be SAR dependent, right? So it's going to be related to the field strength. Yes and no. Uh, yes, but you're right. It's going to be field strength and frequency dependent. So, uh, but, you know, talking about swoop system, 
yeah, the heating is just not going to happen. You know, it's just virtually non-existent. Yeah, a couple of these questions just uh, uh, for context are more related to conventional uh, uh, high field MRI and these yeah. heating issues would uh, not, as as uh, Dr. Schalk explained earlier in his talk, would not be an issue at the uh, at the 0.064 Tesla of the swoop unit. So one last question related to high field and then we have um, one, uh, another question that will come back to low field. So the final question from high field here is, uh, could you comment on uh, retained epicardial wires functioning or abandoned? Uh, and what your perspective is on those at 1.5 and 3 Tesla. And then I have uh, one more low field question after that. Right. So epicardial pacing wires, the ones that are used like in patients that are undergoing bypass surgery or any other instance where they're doing a thoracotomy and they're working on the heart, they'll put in temporary epicardial wires. Those are short. They have high resistance. Those have never posed a hazard or risk to the patient, unlike um abandon intracardiac pacing leads or things that are longer and have coiled, you know, situations and what have you, uh, those are potentially hazardous depending on, you know, the MRI conditions, where's and how much SAR you're using, you know, the frequency and field strength, and also the uh, configuration of the object too. So it's predominantly the amount of the length that's in the Z direction of the MR system, when we're talking about conventional 1.5 and 3 Tesla systems that contribute to the potential amount of heating. But how much heating is going to occur and what is the, um, the uh, implications from a safety consideration? You're going to have a small electrosurgical burn. That's what you're going to have. And keep in mind where the tip of these leads are located it's, you know, in tissue that's, you know, not very viable to begin with. So, you know, is it really a, a huge concern, you know, with regard to safety or a serious injury to a patient? I've never seen anything reported along those lines, but, you know, knowing what we know about the potential for heating and the conditions that cause them, we will intentionally, you know, use low SAR uh, pulse sequences and, and be careful with uh, whatever we're doing. Um, and you may want to do um, monitoring of the patient, you know, at least their EKG when you're scanning patients with abandoned intracardiac leads. Mm -hmm. And Frank, extrapolating that to a low field, ultra low field, everything risks go <laughs> down if not go away. Yeah. And boy, and if you're just scanning the patient's head, right. you know, right. it's no problem, right? Okay, and the last uh, question in the chat, uh, now we're coming back to low field, and it might be appropriate for both uh, you, Frank, and for Eddie to comment on, is whether or not um, um, the with, res with respect to the hyperfine swoop system, is it safe to assume that all patient supporting equipment, including ECMO, in a traditional ICU environment are safe uh, and a non-issue? Go ahead, Eddie. Sure. So as long as it's outside that five gauss line, uh, then there's no magnetic effect. And we have numerous users that clearly do that. In fact, both of you guys, you know, Adichie, you do it all the time in the ICU. There are ECMO users as well, and the ECMO systems are outside of the five gauss line. Where it becomes a potential issue is if there's part of that system that's potentially within that five gauss line. But realize, at least on our hyperfine scanner, the five gauss line extends two and a half feet from the tip of your nose. So the likelihood of you know, the ECMO system itself or a ventilator or a monitor being in that re region is basically next to zero. And and conveniently, uh, Eddie has a picture of the hyperfine swoop behind him and the orange uh, mesh at the top of the device is the five Gauss line. Uh, and it, you can basically open it up and, and de demarcate that in the ICU environment to see where that is. Yeah. I mean, there's a body of literature now and it's growing with regard to uh, patient support equipment, particularly ECMO, uh, intraaortic balloon pumps, other pa patient support equipment being successfully used without any issues and whatsoever. I want to mention a few th important things about the five Gauss level, which is actually changing to nine Gauss in the not too distant future. The reason that exists has nothing to do with um, patient support equipment. It has to do with certain cardiac devices, active cardiac devices that may have programming changes associated with them. And that's a very limited number. And as such, it affects a very limited number of uh, potential individuals, patients and or healthcare workers that have those particular cardiac devices. Um, 
I have a couple of colleagues um, that are working on uh, a, a, a manuscript that gives the history of how that five Gauss information came to be. And also, you know, the implications of now it's going to nine Gauss, because I believe that a lot of in the MR community don't have a full appreciation for that five Gauss information. I can't tell you how many times I've had uh, MR uh, healthcare workers remark to me, particularly um, technologists and radiographers, having an idea that that five Gauss has, you know, it, it exists because if you get too close, now something's going to become a projectile. Nonsense. It relates to only a handful of, of specific cardiac active devices that uh, may have programming changes associated with it. And now that level is going to nine Gauss. All right, well, I, 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 I have to add that there's been a couple more really interesting questions added in the chat. So if you're still agreeable, uh, maybe I'll ask these last two and then we might have to wrap it up as we've uh, uh, gotten to a little bit over our, uh, our planned time, I think. We were planning to end at five, is that right? But we started a bit late. So let's uh, put these two in. We can, keep going. We can keep going. <laughs> all right. <laughs> so the first really question. interesting question is, what are your thoughts? And again, this might be to, to all the panelists on the risks of using these with uh, vagus nerve stimulators or deep brain stimulator patients. So this would be specific to the hyperfine swoop at low field. Uh, thoughts on the risk or safety of, of utilizing uh, of scanning patients with those uh, devices, implants. So our group um, back in 2000, uh, we convened at the Cleveland Clinic and we started studying deep brain stimulation systems. I mean, I got to tell you, the neurosurgeon Ali Razai sent me um, uh, x-rays of DBS systems. I had no idea what these things were. And all I saw were two pulse generators, lead extensions, you know, this pile of linguine of leads, you know, going all different directions and then deep brain. I go, you're never going to be able to scan those patients. The wrong thing to say to a neurosurgeon <laughs> or any, you know, surgeon for that matter, that just, you know, set them off. And we started, you know, testing these things. And that was the first active implant that got MR conditional labeling. So the issues are, you know, MRI related heating, first and foremost, inadvertent uh, stimulation, you know, forced torque of the regular things artifact. Uh, for the uh, swoop scanner, I don't see any reason, you know, now the, the lower in uh, field strength and frequency you go, the longer the length that's potentially hazardous. I mean, you're talking about massively long lengths that would have to exist in order to produce the uh, harm with regard to MRI related heating. We know that it can happen at 1.5 Tesla. We know it can happen at one Tesla. That's where patients have been seriously injured and receive permanent neurological deficits because of excessive heating occurring in the uh, leads and electrodes for DBS systems. We also tested BNS systems. And you know, now you're talking about a cuff electrode you know, that's lower in the uh, uh, anatomy of the patient. So it's around the vagus nerve. And um, you know, so you're gonna be somewhat removed from the potential for MRI-related heating and inadvertent stimulation. I don't see, with my understanding of the swoops, um, static time varying gradients and RF fields, I don't see any hazards that would be um, uh, present for scanning patients with those particular neuromodulation systems. Okay, that's great. And then I think this will be the last question from the uh, chat that we'll do. Uh, the question is, uh, does the um, hyperfine swoop at that level of magnetic field strength, would there be any anticipated effect on the performance of other uh, sensitive equipment. So for example, they're asking about image intensifiers. I might also ask about, you know, ultrasound machines or things like that, that might realistically be brought relatively close to the device. Any chance for interaction and damage or image quality effects from that? I can imagine there would be, but for image quality, but what about damage to the equipment itself? Yes, I, I can take that. I think it would be difficult to get that close to the system itself and you guys have seen it, so you know what I'm talking about. But anecdotally, as part of our demonstration process, our sales team routinely puts their cell phones in the magnet and in the coil without any sort of damage to the device itself. They routinely do it. And in fact, Aditya, you probably realize when you're driving the system around, you put the iPad right on top. You mm -hmm. see, need some place to hold it. So I don't think any of these devices have had any sort of untoward effect by the scanner upon them. 
And I guess they're, they're, more, they're also asking, would it affect, uh, you know, so the way they phrased the question was, uh, would it affect the performance of equipment sensitive to fringe fields below five Gauss, like image intensifiers? Do you think there would be an effect on the performance of those devices if they're in proximity to the unit? I don't think so, but again, Frank's yeah. the expert, I'm going to defer. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I'd like to, you know, get a... Uh, more information and, and do some active uh, actual testing in order to uh, uh, answer this intelligently. One practical aspect of the device is that the patient's head has to be uh, positioned inside of the coil. So if you were to use it in an angio suite, and we've mocked it up, we haven't uh, done a lot of actual scanning in the angio suite, you would generally uh, probably slide them into the unit for scanning, and then you'd slide them back, and then the, the unit would then be moved away. So it probably wouldn't, practically speaking, be directly in the uh, proximity of the image intensifier when you're doing a uh, interventional procedure. But it's an interesting question, certainly. So with that, I'm going to wrap up the question and answer, unless any of the panelists uh, have other other things they want to bring up, and uh, maybe we'll just have a quick wrap up. Uh, oh, Frank, did you want to yeah. make a comment? I had I have one uh, comment and a. Uh, uh, a, uh, a future, you know, possible webinar. I've realized now working with um, uh, Swoop uh, users, you know, throughout um, the country and, you know, actually Canada and other elsewhere in the world, when they're screening patients, they're all over the place. I mean, some of them are still using the same screening procedure that they use for their high field systems. It's ridiculous, right? I mean, look at what we're doing, you know, with the guard to having an understanding of the fields, you need to be able to streamline the process. And I would love to see a, a screening strategy and screening form uh, specifically designed for this uh, low field 0.064 Tesla scanner that I think all the uh, MR users of the Swoop system would benefit from, and definitely their patients would benefit from such a thing. You don't need to use, you know, this, um, you know, extensive screening procedure that we apply mm -hmm. for the high field systems. It's just unnecessary. Yeah, hundred percent right there, Frank. So when when we uh, for our project in Moose Factory, which is northern northern Canada, we had to get ethics approval, and for that, uh, we had to include our screening form. And so we looked far and wide, and there was nothing. Uh, and this was a almost two years ago, nothing for hyperfine uh, or any other low field at the time. So we use the 1.5T and 3T screening forms uh, for that, which is obviously going to be different based on our experience and what you've talked about today for, for all, many or most of these devices. So that's definitely uh, really needed out there and uh, any help you can do that <laughs> for Absolutely. us uh, uh, would, would, be, would be wonderful. Thank you. Or, or people in the field get that question all the time. Yeah. And yeah. Frank knows he's collaborated with some sites in terms of developing a more condensed appropriate screening form. Yeah, I think a condensed screening Thank form you. that is standardized and sort of agreed upon would be yeah. ideal. We also, uh, like Omar mentioned, we are using a standard conventional MR screening, and then decisions beyond that are made by the supervising radiologist. But I think it would make so much sense to have it um, kind of a consensus agreement on that. Um, also, there's a quick question: Is there a screening form for Promaxo, which was the was that that was the low field uh, prostate the, unit, right? It's the single sided mm -hmm. uh, system. And you know what? I'm working on it. Okay, so maybe there's a kind of a confluence of uh, of material that could go into this, uh, and uh, and maybe a um, field strength cutoff for the lower field that we could develop a, a uniform screening for. I think that's a fantastic idea. Absolutely. Yep. So Omar, do you want to wrap up then? Um, yeah, let's. Uh, you know, we've uh, we've gone a little bit over over time, but, which is all right. Uh, uh, so I'd like to thank uh, Frank, uh, Eddie, and and yourself uh, and Pam uh, for um, this webinar, and uh, up to you for all our audience who participated as well. And uh, just before we close, I think Pam's going to share a screen of our upcoming. Uh, webinar. So this this was the third installment of the portable MRI journal slash Queen's University webinar. Um, and we will having our fourth one. Um, you can just uh, maximize that, that Pam. Um, so uh, that will be in September. So save the date, September 20th. So this is going to be another, uh, we hope, very interesting webinar. This will be uh, 
uh, our Canadian experience. So uh, portable MRI cases in ICU at St. Michael's Hospital, U of T led by Dr. Brata and his colleague, uh, colleagues uh, at St. Mike's. And we will also be talking about uh, uh, potential application of ultra low field portable MRI in the ICU to improve CT and MRI access in Canadian hospitals. Uh, multi-center analysis, this is what was, was analysis that we conducted here at uh, Queen's and Kingston General Hospital, along with uh, Aditya and his group at St. Mike's. Uh, so this is very apropos and relevant for wait times in, in Canadian institutions, which is a huge problem uh, in Canada. So uh, I hope you could join us and we'll, we'll be posting um, uh, updates regarding this and, and, and links to registration on the portable MRI journal a website, uh, which is portablemrijournal.org. Also on the Portable MRI Journal LinkedIn page, uh, please uh, go to that visit and, uh, and like it and follow us on the uh, LinkedIn site. With that, uh, thank you very much uh, everyone for joining us and being part of the Q&A and, and uh, we will see you in September. Bye-bye. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Bye.